Proverbs chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 22, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22. The Bible says, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. On this Legacy Sunday, where we're honoring grandparents, I want to preach on the title, the subject, What Does Your Footprint Look Like? What does your footprint look like? Now, when you talk about footprint, I'm not talking about the one with your big toe and and little toe uh, on it. (laughs) I'm talking about, according to the dictionary, this is the area occupied or affected by you. When you talk about the footprint we're leaving and the environmentalists are big about the environmental footprint that we're leaving. In other words, to them, uh, you know, how many plastic bottles are you using a day? That would, that would be uh, something that would go into the footprint we're leaving environmentally. And this is not an environmental sermon. But we all have an area that we affect. We have an area... Uh, that is occupied or influenced by us. And according to Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. What, do you, what are you leaving for your children, your grandchildren? What are you giving to them? What does your footprint look like? The one that you occupy at your house uh, with your grandchildren and I don't think I could, I could ever, ever forget. And for some of you, thinking about grandparents is not a pleasant thought. And this is not meant to conjure up any bad feelings about grandparents that were not what they were supposed to be. Uh, but this is a sermon to help us uh, who are Christians, parents, and grandparents to be what we are supposed to be. Uh, it's not to inflict pain on those of you who've had grandparents that did not treat you. Uh, the way you should have been treated. But I have pleasant memories uh, from both sets of my grandparents. And uh, one, they both had an impact, and I think that's what we all must realize. Uh, I don't get to see mine very much. That does matter, but it doesn't matter as much as you think in the impact that you leave. You leave. You have a footprint of how you've affected and influenced your grandchildren, children, those in the church, and I, I can still see those uh, older men at my church growing up after I got saved and watching them and seeing how they behave, how they carry themselves. And uh, my dad was not saved when I got saved, and my grandpa, he taught me, um, you know, how to, be a, how to be a man. And he taught me how to uh, say yes, sir, no, sir. He taught me how to look people in the eye. He taught me how to grab a hand tight, not like a fish. Amen. Um, and uh, he, he taught me who to watch out for in a bad, I mean, bad influence. Um, he taught me how to have fun. Man, he had the most fun of anybody and probably had the less tools to do it with anybody I know. But he, uh, you know, it's not how much money you have when you have fun. Uh, he'd just be riding down the road as serious as he could be. We'd be talking about something in the Bible. You know what you're building there, don't you? No, sir. Every time. I fell for it every time. Cheese factory. That's okay, good, you know. And, uh, you know, it never was a cheese factory. And uh, then, then one day he changed it up on me a little bit. You know what you're building there, don't you? I said, what, a cheese factory? He said, no, a dry land shipyard. <laughs> I said, okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Paul Paul. And uh, he's taught me how to enjoy life, sitting in, the back of the, sitting in the back of his yard and watching birds, watching nature, how to grow stuff. He taught me some bad habits too. Every grandparent has some bad habits you've taught your grandchildren. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Parents, at least you need to say amen. And uh, he, he had, you know, if, if he did it, I wanted to do it. And he got on this thing where, where he, he felt he was under conviction uh, and, uh, about, about chewing tobacco. And, uh, and that was a good thing. Amen. Well, it's hard to say in Winston-Salem, isn't it? 
And so he, he started putting whole cloves in his mouth. Y'all know what cloves are. You buy them in the grocery store. He'd take the head off of the clove and put it in his mouth. I didn't know why he was doing that. I just knew he was doing it. So I thought, hey, it's good for Papa. It's good for me. So I'd go around with a box of McCormick cloves in my, in my pocket and put them in my mouth, you know. And, uh, and I don't guess it hurt me any, but it sure was strong. It was stout, I tell you. But he'd have two or three at a time, and he'd, sit, he'd bite on I'd bite on and The more you bite, the more bitter it gets. It's not good if you're thinking about doing that. It's not good. And uh, so, I, I, I mean, everything, I took it all in. I think it's important to remember that, too, before I get into the message. They take it all in. <laughs> good, bad, whatever. They, they get it all. Like, you don't say, well, okay now, grandkids, I want y'all to get this part and this side of Grandpa and Granny or Papa and Nana, excuse me. <laughs> but I don't want you to get this part. I got a newsflash. They get it all. Parents, same thing. They get it all. Church members, they get it all. They don't get just the parts we want them to get. What should, our, what should our footprint look like? First of all, it ought to be a footprint of salvation. They ought to, what are you leaving your kids, your grandkids, church kids? It ought to be a legacy of, what kind of legacy are you leaving? What kind of footprint are you making, are you leaving? It ought to be a legacy of salvation. Everybody that you come in contact with, home or not home, church or not church, ought to know that you know without a doubt that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Your sins have been forgiven and they don't have to worry about it when death comes and the funeral's calling and asking, uh, you know, and, and the pastor's trying to ask that didn't know you, uh, was the person saved or not? There ought not be any hesitation in the minds and hearts of a family. And uh, let me just say, in our day, in our culture, you know, you go to the funeral home, everybody's going to heaven. I got some biblical news for you. Everybody's not going to heaven. There's two places we go when we die, heaven or hell. And just because we were good does not mean we're going to heaven. And um, the Bible says there's only one way to heaven, that's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven. And uh, it, it, ought to be, it ought to be a regular occurrence for you to rehearse how that you got saved. It ought to be regular. Your grandkids, your kids, church people, any kind of people, wherever you go, wherever you work, wherever you uh, blog, wherever you are, whatever your footprint is on life, and we all have one. We all have people that we influence. You probably, on the average, you'll influence about 2,200 people per person. Directly. In a big way. Indirectly, many more than that. But you'll directly influence about 200 people. You say, ah, it ain't that big. Yeah, it is. It's bigger than you think. It's bigger than you think. And they ought to, they ought to know and they ought not see anything uh, that gives them evidence otherwise. They ought not have any materials to prove that you're not saved. Matter of fact, the Bible says, by the fruits you shall know them. They ought to have fruits meet for repentance. They ought to have fruits uh, that indicate, that validate you are born again and you're saved. Uh, you ought to rehearse this often. You ought to rehearse it with your family. You ought to talk about it. I'll never forget my grandpa. He talked about it often. He talked about when, when uh, he got saved. He told me about when he got saved. He told me over and over and over again about how he got saved, when he got saved, who led him to Christ. Uh, he, it was not a secret that he uh, was born again. And it ought not be a secret. They ought not know more about your work or your job than they do about your salvation. They ought not be more informed about the things you do at work than your salvation testimony. You ought to leave a legacy that Paul, Paul, Grandpa, Grandma was born again, they were saved. Dads and moms, same deal. You ought to, you ought to leave a legacy that, that you were born again. Acts 16, 31, the Bible says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I mean, the whole house got it. 
When daddy got it, the whole house got it. And I want to say to you, men who lead the home, grandpas who lead families, uh, it's important for you not to rely on the testimony of grandma or mama. It's important for you not to rely on the testimony of somebody else or what people told you about your testimony. It's important for you to have a testimony to share with your children and your grandchildren. It's better than any ghost story. It's better than any bedtime story. It's better than any cockamamie false story that you're going to conjure up to tell them to, to impress them. It's the best story you could ever tell them and that is how you realize you were a sinner on your way to hell and Jesus Christ intercepted you going to hell and saved your soul and you've never been the same since. That's the best story you could ever hand down, leave as a legacy, as a footprint to your children or grandchildren or those who knew you is that you're born again. You said, Pastor, we're in church. Of course we're saved. Going to church does not make you any more Christian than you standing in the carport makes you a car. You must be born again to go to heaven. And you must know it. It's more than just, you know, I did that when I was five. And, I, you know, don't really, I, and you can get saved when you're five, but you better know you got saved when you were five. You can get saved when you're seven. I don't know the age of accountability for you. But I do know this. You better know it. You better know when you came under conviction. That's a good sign. You're hitting that age. When, when God the Holy Ghost convicted your heart about your sins and about the fact that sin separates us from God. And there's a penalty for sin. And that penalty is, is death. Not just physical death, but the second death we learn about in Revelation. We must come to the realization that we are under judgment and that Jesus Christ is the only way out. I don't care how long you've rode a bus, drove a bus, helped in a Sunday school class, been a member of a church, baptized, as the, as the old preacher says, been baptized uh, so much the tadpoles know your name. And you know, hopefully there's no tadpoles in here. Amen. That was when they baptized in the creek. But you know, none of that's going to matter. When you stand before God, you ought to have a testimony now. Not when, you, not when you're here. Right here, where you're at now. Don't wait till you're here for somebody to make up some testimony that wasn't true. Don't wait till you're here to try to convince somebody that you really were saved. Convince them now. Amen. Have a testimony, a footprint that says, I know daddy was saved. I know mama was saved. I know grandma was saved. Grandpa was saved. I know without a doubt that they were born again. I saw fruits of it. I saw them praying. I saw them crying over my soul. I saw them interested in church and the Bible. I have, I have things, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, I know. Brother Randy, it's good. I don't think you had any doubt or wonder about your father and where he went. It wasn't because of what he told you he was. It was because of what he was. The life he lived, his testimony, because he trusted Jesus Christ and it was evident. Number one, there ought to be a legacy of salvation. Number two, there ought to be a legacy of sacrifice. I'm talking about our footprint now, how, how wide, how big is it? There ought to be a legacy of sacrifice. Turn over to Genesis chapter 22 if you have your Bibles. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, and you know this story well. Genesis chapter 22. Verse number 8. Here we have Abraham taking Isaac of Mount Moriah to sacrifice him at God's bidding. In verse 8 we come to, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. This is after Isaac says, We got the wood, we got everything, but where's, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham replies in verse 8 here, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went together. Both of them together. They both went together. 
Isaac saw a dad who was willing to sacrifice for God. Not only should we leave a legacy that we're saved, no doubt about it. I mean, you ought to talk about it. You ought to get in your family circle and talk about it. You ought to talk about it when you go to bed. You ought to talk about it when you get up according to Proverbs. I mean, if the Jews are going to put verses over their head and over their doorways, at least we can do is tell it far and wide about how Jesus Christ saved our souls. We ought to tell it everywhere we go. We ought to tell it. Our kids ought to hear us tell it. They ought to see it, but they ought to see sacrifice, number two. They ought to see sacrifice for the Lord and His work. And notice the word here, so they went both of them together. They didn't just, he didn't sacrifice on his own. He went, they, he went together. He took, took the kids with him. And that's why it's important. I don't think it's a sacrifice to go to church. I think it's an obligation and responsibility for a child of God. It's a privilege. It's an honor. But he went together. But when I'm talking about sacrifice, you, you, you ought not send your kids. Obviously, you ought to take them. You ought not tell them, you know, and I understand you can worship God wherever you are. And I get that. And we live in a day where everybody wants to do that instead of uh, assembling themselves together. As the book of Hebrews teaches us to do. There's no substitute for corporate worship. You, you can worship the Lord in a deer stand just as good as you can here. I agree with that. Yes, sir, I, I, I got you. Why does it always have to be on Sunday when you do that? Why don't you do it Tuesday when you're supposed to be at work? Isn't that funny how it's always the Lord's day when, when we want a deer hunt instead of go to church? Well, you know, it's, it's ball. On, on, I can worship God on the field. Well, you can worship the Lord anywhere, but it's funny how it always ends up on the Lord's day when we won't do that. Not the boss's day. <laughs> but they ought to see a sacrifice in you just like, just like Abraham showed to Isaac. They ought to see Papa and Granny. They ought to see Mom and Daddy. They ought to see them sacrifice for the work of the Lord. They ought to hear about it. They ought to see it. They ought not have to wonder. You know, we, we put every part of our life on the line. There's more information about you on social media today than there's ever been. So pray tell me, why in the world are we so skittish about telling our children and our grandchildren about what God is doing in our hearts? Man, we want to tell the world on social media about all that's happening at Walmart, all that's happening in the world. But we won't sit down with our kids and grandkids and tell them about what all is happening in our own heart. It's a shame. They ought to have, we ought to have a legacy of sacrifice for the work of God and the house of God. They ought to know that Jesus is important. If they know you're saved, they ought to know that Jesus is important to you. They ought to know it's going to take a whole lot to keep you out of church. It's going to take a John Deere tractor and a log chain to keep you out of church. They ought to know that. They ought to know that you're not just going to flip with everything that comes along. Amen. I didn't ever ask my grandpa, reckon we going today? He was in there at 8.30. Sunday school didn't start at 10. He was in there at 8.30 on the dining room table making his tithe out, him and Momo. They were making their tithe out at 8.30 in the morning in Sunday school, and they didn't teach Sunday school. They were, they were dressed and ready to go when Jerry Falwell came on the TV at 8 o'clock. Y'all remember when he came on Old Time Gospel Hour in the morning, way back when it was good? And, and he came on... And, and I remember I'd be sitting there. I thought, why are we up so early? It don't start till 10. And we're watching Jerry Falwell at 8. I thought, what do y'all got? And is somebody coming over? Are we going somewhere? They're just sitting there, tie on, shirt and tie. Had, had enough hairspray. I mean, you could have stopped an army with his hairspray. <laughs> I mean, just sprayed everywhere. All over. He'd hold his hand right here and he'd just go to town. And he didn't have a one strand, you know, he'd whip that thing around. And... <laughs> I promise you, before he left the yard, that hair wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> and Mamaw was the same way. 
I mean, just like you just put a, a bowl, on, and they may have at the beauty shop. I mean, just put, put it on her head, and that's the way it came out. And it didn't move either, neither one of them. And uh, dressed up, but I never wondered about are they going. I never wondered about if they was going to be in there on the dining room table fixing out the tie. Spiritual things ought never be negotiable in your home, your grand, I mean, grandparents. You, we can fuss all we want. Yeah, I didn't raise mine. It ain't my job to raise them now. Well, if nobody's doing it, then it is. There's more kids living with their grandparents now than ever before. Somebody's got to do it. Amen. You said it ought to be the parents. You're right. But I thank God Paul Paul did his part. I'm glad he did his part. I'm glad he took me to church. I never wondered about it. Whether he's going, never wondered about what he's going to do on Sunday. We didn't, we didn't, y- y'all reckon you want to go back Sunday night? That was never a question. That wasn't a question. The same thing. Can of hairspray. The only difference, Jerry Falwell wasn't on in the evening. We was going right back, you know. And we did have the best afternoon nap you ever drink. I mean, it was wonderful. That's the best sleep I've ever had in my life. Maybe because of the pressures that wasn't on me at that point in life. I think that's why it was so good. How many of y'all believe that? Yeah. I mean, sleep with Grandpa. When he'd say, let's go take a nap on Sunday afternoon. I, I'm telling you, that was the best sleep I ever had in my life. I never had any like that since. Amen. <laughs> it was good. Sacrifice. They ought to see it. David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa, spent 33 years in the heart of Africa. He endured suffering like no other to spread the gospel and open the continent to missionaries. That was his life work. And somebody remarked, or he remarked, somebody asked him about sacrifice. He said this, people talk of the sacrifice I've made in spending so much of my life in Africa. He said, can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be hereafter revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk. When we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. They ought to see that in you. They ought to see it in you. March 24th, 1998, right outside of Jonesboro, Arkansas, in the middle school, five people were killed, four innocent young ladies, and one expecting mother, teacher, were killed at a school shooting. Ten people, nine students, one teacher were injured. Two students, 13-year-old Mitchell Johnson, 11-year-old Andrew Golden, were shooting in an ambush style. They were hanging out in the woods. One of them pulled the fire alarm. You may remember it. It was one of the first, not one of the only, but one of the times it got headlines, uh, school shootings. And so they hid in the woods, pulled the fire alarm. When everybody came out, then they started shooting. On the night before the shooting, Andrew Golden assisted Johnson. They loaded their mothers, 13 and 11 years old now. They loaded their mothers' Dodge Caravan with camping supplies, snack food, seven weapons, two semi-automatic rifles, bolt-action rifle, and four handguns, which they had stolen from Golden's grandfather's house. The following morning, the boys drove the, the van to the West Side Middle School. As they arrived, Golden pulled, like I said, the fire alarm, and uh, then Mitchell ran back to the woods, had the weapons. When the children and teachers filed out, they shot four female students and one teacher. Shannon Wright was the teacher that was killed in the incident. She was murdered. 
Witnesses said that when the shots rang out, she realized the danger and she jumped in front of the kids. This is a mother with a baby in her belly. And she jumps in front of these other kids. And she was shot and killed. Only one thing was on her mind. Saving those children. Much to my dismay, both those boys got out of juvenile detention when they were 21 years old. Mitchell ended up back in prison. Golden was just recently, he changed his name. And he was just recently killed in a car crash. But you know, that woman did something that every one of us have the obligation to do. Sacrifice for God in front of our children. We have the responsibility. They ought to see it. And no matter what's coming, and, and it doesn't matter whose job, when you're talking about war, when you're talking about battle, we, we, don't, get into, uh, we don't get into arguments about whose job it is and whose responsibility. Well, that's, that's, the, that's, the, you know, that's his grandparents' Uh, side uh, responsibility. Well, that's her parents' side to do that. Well, it's their time to do that. W when is somebody going to realize our children and grandchildren are under attack and Satan, again, doesn't care how he does it. He just wants to destroy them. And he, God, is looking for somebody who will leave a footprint not only of salvation but of sacrifice and say, I'm going to do everything I can in my power not only to sacrifice for Jesus, but I'm going to sacrifice the things, the good, the comfort uh, to get in line, to get in front of my grandchildren, uh, my children, uh, whatever the case may be, somebody else's children or grandchildren, somebody is got to understand it is our responsibility to shield to guard to protect I mean what a travesty to understand we have a generation of young people that nobody's guarding nobody's jumping in front of nobody's protecting We've opened the floodgates of our culture and said, hey, Satan, come on in under the guise of cute, under the guise of funny, under the guise of culturally acceptable. We have let Satan into our hearts and our homes and we are not standing in front of them and shielding them from the fiery darts of Satan. And God help us, somebody has got to step in front of them and protect them. It's not about your 401k. It's not about your fancy Mustang. It's about a generation of of young people that need somebody to protect and to stand in front of. Amen. We all worry about whose job it is. It's your job. It's your responsibility. Daddies, it's your job. Mamas, it's your job. If I had a better husband, if I had a better wife, if I had a better... Give me that. You actually think you're going to say that at the judgment seat of Christ when you're looking into the eyes of Jesus Christ? It's your job. It's my job. Those kids that you teach, it's your job. The kids of those, that, that, of, of the parents, you're around their parents, it's your job to influence the parents so that they do what they should do in front of the kids. It never stops. Your job, your responsibility, never stop. Your footprint, how, how, what does it look like? Is it just you and what you need? Or is it some, are you understanding the responsibility you have, not just to your children, not just to your ch grandchildren, but the children of a whole generation? Man, what in the world has Satan stolen from us? And it's, it's because peop, nobody wants to take responsibility. We see that in our culture. Man, you have something happen, nobody wants to be responsible. You let somebody murder somebody and they go around house to house saying, did you see something? I didn't see nothing. Because nobody wants to be responsible. It's time God's people took responsibility. Well, they're not my children. Well, do they have a soul? And let me ask us a question this morning. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ died for everybody? Would you lift your hand? 
How many of you believe that God is not willing that any should perish? Would you raise your hand? Then let me ask you this. How many of you believe that you are responsible if they do? If they never hear the gospel and they plunge into hell, guess who's responsible? Not just me. Not just me. You. It's our responsibility. Footprint of salvation, footprint of sacrifice. Number three, or you can leave a footprint of scorn. What is scorn? It's open or unqualified contempt or disdain. Lamentations 5, 7. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Jeremiah here says, our fathers have sinned, and we're paying the price. What are you going to leave your children? A testimony of salvation, a legacy of salvation, a legacy of sacrifice, or a legacy of scorn? Just didn't do right, didn't want to do right, did what they wanted to do. Papa always did his own thing. He was kind of a free spirit, did what he wanted. Grandma, daddy, mama, listen to me. That's a testimony. That's a footprint. It's not a good one, but it is one. He says, hey, we're suffering because Papa and Mama didn't do what they were supposed to do. He says, we have borne the iniquity. Daddy and Mama didn't do what they were supposed to. We have borne that iniquity. We paid the price. We paid the price because Mom and Daddy, because church member, we borne the iniquities of them. Do you know somebody else will pay your tab? Now you're going to stand before God and give account to God for your life. Somebody else will have to pay for what you leave. You ever know the guy that never has his bill for when you go out to eat? Oh, oh, man. Uh, uh. Y'all, and, 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 and didn't do it at the table when he came in. He's in front of the cashier that you know. And it, oh, I forgot my billfold. Hey, brother, you don't mind. This is one tab I don't want my kids to have to pay for. I don't want to give my kids a tab of scorn, of iniquity. Remember those kids that made fun of the preacher? Remember that? And the she-bearers came and ate every one of them, 2 Kings 2, 24. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bearers out of the woods and take 40 and two children of them. 42 children were killed because they made fun of the preacher. And not just making fun of the preacher, but when you don't do what you're supposed to do, what God wants you to do, you know what it leads to? A life of scorn. And contempt. And what about it? What about that word scorn? Open or unqualified contempt. You're leaving a tab of iniquity to your children and your grandchildren. I don't want to leave a tab of iniquity that they're going to have to pay for. Some of you are doing stuff right now or not doing stuff right now that your children or grandchildren are going to have to pay for. May God help us to protect them. If you knew, I mean, if you, if you had, if you made enough money, you would lay up stuff. You would look ahead and look for your grandchildren and lay up money and lay up investments and invest for them and provide for them and just look for. I mean, you're, you're thinking ahead about when you die and, and the grandkids are left or the kids are left and I'm going to provide for mom and the kids and we do that financially. Why don't we do it spiritually? And we think about it, we study about it. Let's study about our decisions and our actions because they will leave a tab for your children and grandchildren that they're going to have to pay. They said, hey, we borne the iniquities of our fathers. Our fathers didn't pray. They didn't read their Bible. They didn't love God. They, didn't, they weren't faithful to God. We borne the iniquity of our fathers. May God help us to take that debt out from the hands of our children and our grandchildren. And say, when I, when I leave this life, I'm going to leave them something that never dies, a testimony that I was saved, a testimony that I sacrificed for Jesus Christ and lived a life of sacrifice. That's what I'm going to leave them. That's my footprint. That's my legacy. May God help us. What are you leaving them? What are you leaving them right now? If you were to die right now, what are you leaving them? 